Today's episode is with special guest Susie Tucker, where we look at how nuance requires courage, hoarding expression, and the questions around life of do we bother to take ourselves seriously? Can we look instead of not look in order to honor our experiences? And do we let ourselves complete things so we can feel our own competence? Hello and welcome. You're listening to the Embody Podcast a show about remembering and embodying your true nature, inner wisdom, embodied healing, and self-love. My name is Candace Wu, and I'm a holistic healing facilitator, intuitive coach, and artist sharing my personal journey of vulnerability, offering meditations and guided healing support, and having co-creative conversations with healers and wellness practitioners from all over the world. If this episode or other podcasts have touched you in any way, supported you in your life, or inspired you to heal or love yourself, I would be so grateful if you thought about contributing to my Patreon page. It's a place where you can donate as little or as much as you'd like to, and in exchange, you can also get some lovely gifts with a new gift out there that is a monthly call for a group of four people at a time where you can get embodied and soul support for whatever you're going through in your life. This is not your typical coaching call where we just talk about what's going on in your life. It's where you can receive embodied support to move through your felt sense, to tap into your own and inner wisdom and your intuition, as well as move through any pieces of blocks that are coming up in your experience. If you'd like to check it out, go to my page at candicewu.com slash Patreon. And now let's jump into the episode. Welcome back, everyone. It's great to have you here today. And it's really an honor to have Susie Tucker on the show today. Susie is one of my Family Constellations teachers. She facilitates Family Constellations beautifully, and she can just practically speak the language of anyone. She has this beautiful flair for tuning into the language set of you and where you came from, your ancestry, the things that you picked up along the way to touch into the antidote and the missing pieces of what's not been said or the healing step that can be acknowledged. Whenever I talk to Susie, I feel like we are working with life as a piece of artwork and I just feel this artistry come through where I can look at my life in a nonlinear way, where I just feel the movements and the subtleties with more beauty. What I've experienced with Susie as a client and as a student is that whatever words I'm bringing to the struggle of my situation seem to just open up an entire field of what's happened in my family ancestry so that it can be honored and released and that I no longer have to carry it or be loyal to some pain or dynamic and that I can be freer in my life now to step into the possibilities that I didn't even know were there, to feel more ease in myself as I walk into any situation and just exist in this life now. Susie's also a writer and it's through writing that she became interested in the work of Bert Hellinger who developed Family Constellations as the editor-in-chief of Zyg, Tucker, and Tyson, the publishers. While she was in her career in publishing, she co-founded the Bert Hellinger Institute and went on to study, teach, and facilitate Family Constellations on her own. She is incredibly gifted and quite magical. So here's Susie. Well, Susie, I am so happy that you're here with me today and that we get to have this conversation. This is already a gift for me. Um, Susie, you've been my teacher and colleague, and that's a little bit hard to say because I see you in a different space, and we can talk about that a little, but I just want to welcome you today. Thank you. It's a gift for me as well, Candice. I uh, enjoy these conversations in general because for me, they are just conversations, but I wrote this to you. I love how you're showing up in the world, and it's my great honor to join you for a little while today. Thank you. 
when you mm-hmm. said that, that just that meant so much to me because it's something I've been working on with you specifically, and I see how you show up in the world, and I read what you write, and I just love how you're sharing bits and pieces of your experience, and in a way that feels so humble and informative and and offering. And I just, I appreciate that so much about you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, um, you know, it's funny, just as you were talking, I'm thinking um, that one of the differences sort of between my life now and I always laugh because I don't know, 10 years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago, who knows, Mm -hmm. is the kind of opening of portals of expression. I think that when I think of how life has changed, can change, there is a place where there is so much inside of all of us and there has been so much inside of me that at a certain point, the idea of not expressing it became a really destructive uh, feeling. And that simple expression, whether it's to write or to, you know, I'm a crappy painter, but I love to paint (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, painting, or I also do some drawing, which is worse than my painting, but I love (laughs) that too, or walking or speaking to you, these portals of communication and expression alleviate sort of internal pressure. I love the idea that I can bring something to somebody else and that act of creativity is very, I'm trying to avoid the word healing, but that's the word that comes to me, a healing for me. So these moments Mm. are reciprocal. Mm, That's lovely. Yeah, I can really resonate with that. In a similar way, I was experiencing that I was hoarding all the things I wanted to say. And that related so much to my family system, feeling like they didn't have enough and not being enough and hoarding all of that. And it's funny how that can that showed up in ways with objects in my family's life, like objects in the home. Yeah. But then for me, it showed up in the way I was. I was afraid to express myself and still am some days. But I'm just aware of the fact of letting that come through. I love that. I I hadn't thought to use that word before, but of course I love words. So I'm just, I'm going to just, you know, uh, very, very publicly here, lift it from you. Um, (laughs) Feel free. (laughs) uh, uh, But that idea of hoarding expression, I think, is a really um, useful idea because, again, you know, when you think about the, you know, visual of hoarding, we collect so much, too much that it topples over onto us and can actually suffocate us, right? Yeah. So that idea of hoarding emotion, hoarding expression with the assumption that we're somehow not worthy. And of course, in a way, that's a dual assumption because there is the sense, you know, I think always from our systems in one way or another that we're not allowed or we don't have enough or what we say is not important enough. And at the same time, there is a request, an implicit request that the world come toward us to validate us. Mm -hmm. And so it's a funny sort of insecure, difficult place that also has, I think, a very young expectation or wish that comes with it. And of course, the more we wish in a way, the more passive we are. And the more passive we are, the more suffocated we are. So these these ways of expression, and when I see you do the interviews and I see you do the podcast, and I, I even see the photographs that you post and the statements that you make, they're like throwing pebbles into the water and you don't know where those circles are going to extend to. You're only, you know, it's an act of faith to throw the pebble 
And then there's this beautiful thing of those circles reach some of us and we look back at you, Candice, and we say, yes, this has meaning to me. And other people, perhaps those circles don't reach, but you don't even know it because you're tossing the next pebble. And Mm -hmm. I think that the kind of consistent tossing of the pebbles Mm -hmm. (laughs) is uh, where it's at on some on some level and that's humble I suppose and it has a certain audacity too (laughs) um a kind of beautiful audacity yeah Um, (laughs) (laughs) that's a lovely image I actually was having something similar the other day thinking about how I want to act and be and the experience of how do I connect with anything that I'm doing, maybe it's writing a bill for taxes. Uh And how can I feel into this for whatever it is, and feel that it's something that might be interesting or joyful or helpful to me. And let that be a bit of like sprinkling of joy into my life. And Mm -hmm. just let each act contain that as it goes out. And then it's done. So I can feel the fullness of it. And because I I think I can feel the dark side of things a lot easier now in my life because I've worked so hard at it. But to feel the light of the joy in it and how good something might be as well in the fullness of a moment, then it it, it feels just like a complete act to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's funny, I got as you're talking, I got a picture quite literally of, you know, pressing sand or licking the envelope (laughs) and how how those are acts of completion. And I think actually something Mm -hmm. that we can take the opportunity if we are so absurdist to do that, to um, kind of let ourselves complete things and let ourselves feel the kind of competence of completion. You know, (laughs) I I think that there is, you know, for me, Of course, I go through phases of, you know, what I'm interested in as I'm teaching. And, you know, one of the things I'm really interested in is people feeling their own competence. And, of course, that's because I feel more competent than I did, you know, three weeks ago. And it's a great relief because that's a big space. Competence is a big space. And I think uh, competence is filled with these moments of small completions mm. that and that's related to integration as well that if we don't have those moments of small completions then every next thing that we do has a little bit of residue that uh, we feel and no longer attend to and as we move on you know that residue builds Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we feel the drag of it, even though our minds have forgotten what it's related to. So I love the idea of the moments Mm -hmm. of small completion. And the other thing that comes to mind as you're paying your taxes, uh, and this Mm -hmm. is something that I actually find very helpful to me when I'm in moments of anxiety that it has to do with taxes or doctors or You know, I interacted badly with somebody and I can feel that and I'm not quite sure what to do about it. At any rate, um, one of the things that was really helpful to me is kind of feeling myself shoulder to shoulder with all the people paying their taxes or (laughs) going going to the doctor or who have interacted badly today. And it's a funny thing. Right. But um, I think so much of the price we pay is because we feel isolated in whatever anxiety we're experiencing. So, you know, in addition to breath and all those good things that the mindfulness teachers teach us, I also have this sense of being shoulder to shoulder with others and not in isolation. That's extremely helpful. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I can just feel it. It's like like an easing up in my body that just lets it move a little easier. (laughs) We 
Yeah, like we don't need to punish ourselves by being alone in it. Right, right. And, and that's, I think that's a good, uh, you know, another good word that's kind of self punitive behavior is very, it's very isolated and it's very private. Other people don't even know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Well, we just jumped right in, Susie, um, but I want to dra- backtrack a little bit and offer some space for you to share who you are today. You've been doing Constellations work for a long time. And um, would you introduce yourself to the audience sure. listening? Sure, sure. I haven't done that, have I? Yeah. Um, I'm Susie Tucker, and uh, yeah, I've been doing constellation work in one way or another since 1998, actually, beginning in the book world where I met constellation work, and I met Bert Hellinger and Hunter Beaumont and Gunther Weber and Harold Honan, who really were the pillars of constellation work way back then. And so I started as a publisher, literally publishing Bert's first books and working as an editor to sort of translate from the translation into what I thought, you know, a psychotherapeutic audience might understand or find useful. So that was, you know, my first, my first steps were as a translator. And I would say, in a way, that's where I feel my strength now as well, that I look to the core observations of the work, and I attempt to translate them, not protectively, but translate that kind of essential piece that Bert brought to the world that itself is an assimilation of many, many things, an integration of many, many ways of thinking and many thinkers. So I still see myself sort of as a translator in a way. I started organizing for Bert in, I think, around 2000. And I started working with a man named Harold Honan, who was a main teacher then and truly magnificent teacher. And we organized on the East Coast the first courses that actually taught, trained many of the people who are working in the field today still. Mm -hmm. And I'm so proud when I see these different people. And then in my mind's eye, I see them in the circle at the New York Core Center on 23rd Street in Manhattan, learning from Harold Honan. And eventually that, uh, Harold went back to Germany and he kind of, how would I say this? He kind of kicked me in the butt, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, and it hurt. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, to facilitate and teach I think the way he saw it was what he had taught me. And I, you know, I referred back to this, idea. you know, we started out talking about this idea of insecurity and how there's a certain kind of conceit in that sometimes. And obviously I speak from direct experience uh, wherein I both felt very insecure and shy about the idea of teaching and I think what he reacted to was I was sort of asking for him to validate me. And what his perspective was, was I gave you a gift. Are you giving it back? Mm. And it was the first time I started really kind of thinking about how a certain kind of insecurity asks too much of the world. Mm -hmm. And I started just going out there (laughs) well before I felt ready because, you know, I would still not be doing it, I suppose, if I waited to feel ready. (laughs) And I started facilitating very small workshops in the early 2000s. And I started teaching. And I just kept showing up. I was amazed by my own behavior. 
I was amazed that I was being tenacious about something. I would say prior to these moments of teaching, my great power was that if it didn't succeed immediately, I would simply withdraw from whatever it was. Mm. Um, (laughs) I, I was experiencing myself differently without knowing why beforehand. Mm. I think I was engaged back then in the beginnings of a real creative life, a sort of artist's life, which is how I see facilitation to this day. You know, the idea of who am I now? Well, I don't know, because as soon as I articulate it, it will will be past. Mm-hmm. I know that my job is to show up, learn languages very quickly. You know, my kind of artist way here is to invite people in and enter into brief collaborations in which I offer a way of seeing that inspires them to a new way of seeing. And the way that I can do that, or the reason I can do that, is because I'm not caught in the self, same self-limiting beliefs or vistas that they're caught in. And so I get to join people in these moments of soft or brilliant, and sometimes they're very subtle, and sometimes they're traumatic, collaborations and that I keep showing up for because it's like it's like choreography or being in a symphony or putting paint to canvas or words to page and getting to work with others and doing that and learning how to integrate and learning how to keep going toward more And you talked before about this idea of darkness. And I think, yeah, we all have that darkness, right? And what creativity does is it allows for an imbalance to happen. Mm. So that largeness or lightness or expansiveness, any of those words, becomes the bigger thing for a moment. And in that moment, it can encompass or envelop or integrate the darkness Mm -hmm. and then the darkness can have a place and become a part of creativity not separate from it i can see that as you're saying it and you said putting paint to canvas or words to page in my experience of working with you as a client and as a student i experience also this crossover of that of like words to the paint that's beautiful because and that just leads me to, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I, I, I want to hear this leads me to, but just as you say, I, I have to say that is actually my mother and my father. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so they just, they just came and sat down. And sat me up, honey, is that? Oh, wow. <laughs> how do you want to say a little more how you see that? Well, I, you know, it's, it's something that it's funny. I see it in increments, right? So in this moment, I saw it, saw it so clearly and I began to see it in a uh, probably more formal way years ago because it occurred to me to, to try to see it, right? To try to um, kind of create or feel into what it was that I was bringing forward. Now it, it, comes upon me in in Mm. moments of surprise it's not formal anymore so my mother was all about language and she was um actually a brilliant editor and a very very strong writer although it's something that she uh i think was always more comfortable not happier but more comfortable facilitating others and my father was an artist and was a good drawer, could really render likenesses in a very, very good way. He drew, he was a fashion artist, so 
long time ago, you know, they would use fashion illustration in the New York Times or in the fashion magazines. And he did that before I knew him. And I have little tiny, I guess, what were ads snipped out of magazines in a box that he did. And, you know, very gestural and uh, evocative drawings. And so I feel that, you know, words have that movement, have that possibility of gesture and movement and cadence. And I think of him and I think, yeah, he was a poet with his lines on the page. And in a way, she was an artist with her words. And so somehow they come together in me, at least in my interests. <laughs> oh, yeah, that gives me chills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I experience you as as doing that, as using words. It's almost like tuning right into the place where words either were silenced or what the experience of something really demands to be seen. And experienced, and that you place that somehow the words seem to just come right out of your mouth. Yeah, that's that's interesting. They, um, you know, what some, no, not what some, what I feel <laughs> mm -hmm. is that it is also a collaborative experience, and that the words that come out of my mouth are in the sort of words that float or perhaps actually are underneath, maybe they're not above, they're actually underneath both my lineage, my system, and the lineage and system of the person with whom I'm working. And so it's almost like they are the drops that, you know, when you scratch at the root of something, and liquid comes out, the liquid that feeds the flower or the plant or the tree, that those words are underneath the systems and that they're silenced not only for the client, but the client's silence or experience of being quieted or being directed to express in a certain way is always nested in other people's quiet, right? So the mother or the father who is heavy handed in their expectation of a child, what he or she can say, mm -hmm. right? Is always nested in a previous experience of that. It doesn't come from the mother or the father. It comes through the mother or the father. And so my sense of what's being expressed in those moments where it does resonate, where it's not just me sort of uh, imposing my will, which sometimes happens as well. You know, I so much want somebody to get whatever it is <laughs> that mm -hmm. I see that my voice gets high in my chest and has a kind of quality of untruth in it. But when I'm at my best, when I am most attuned, I'm actually hearing what is in the depths or the ground in the other person's system. And it is always about, in a way, where the force of love got either circumvented somehow, right, or almost cut off, not cut off, but almost cut off and distorted somehow because i think you know the work that we do is all about love but love is not necessarily a positive thing love is a force like the wind right so sometimes the wind blows too hard and topples us over right or sometimes we feel that we can't get breath we can't the wind is not blowing enough. There's no breeze. We can't move. So it, those words, those resonant words are in accord with just the right wind. You know, love, 
just the right love, just the right kind of sweet love that can keep us going. So I feel all my language when it's at its best is collaborative. I don't have that language by myself. I only have it with you or with whomever I'm uh, sitting beside. That's really powerful. It feels like it acknowledges so much. And that's something I continue to learn from you is how do we embrace more in the picture and more behind us and more that's embedded or nested, as you said, in the experience. And I'm wondering about if this is part of what you might speak about with, uh, you have a program called The Right to Write. Mm -hmm. And I know we've talked about, I think it was the first time that I wanted to, to facilitate. And you asked me, do I have a right to? And I had to, I, I didn't know what it really meant. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and I, I sat with it and thought about it and felt it. And, and then somehow I came up with, yes, I do. <laughs> but I don't even know, you know, what that was. But can you say more about this? And, and is this part of the right to write that you experience is collaborating? And that's a very generalized question. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a great, it's a great question. I, I just think it's, it's uh, I really get that. If you'd sit back and first of all say, what the hell is she asking me? Yeah. And, <laughs> and then kind of sit back and think, well, also, I wonder, like, you know, what, what, what is being asked? And, and I wonder, right? Yeah. And then the answer, um, you know, I feel that internal, that internal yes is um, exactly what allows one to kind of throw that first pebble because that's really just really what it is, is, you know, do I have the kind of bandwidth to throw that first pebble? Because once I do that, something is going to come back to me and am I prepared in a way to catch it and work with it and say, okay, again, yes, again. So. You know, the, the right to write, I think, is um, this sense of if we have to be perfect. And I always, you know, <laughs> I always argue with the word perfection because I think people forget how idiosyncratic it, that I, even that idea is. You know, people say, I, don't, I realize I didn't have to be perfect, but perfect is a completely fluid concept <laughs> yeah. so, one person's perfection is absolutely not the other person's perfect perfection right? yeah right but it is this sense of you know if I can allow for my own flaws to be fluid so that at some point that if I keep going those very things that are flaws that I detect as vulnerabilities, flaws, difficulties, outright things that I hate about myself, if I can stay fluid with them, actually they become strengths elsewhere, right? Mm -hmm. So what I have to be convinced of, the right to write is the right to keep going. Now, we can say we wake up every day and we keep going, but that's not what I mean, right? I mean... Mm -hmm this sense that the parameters or the, so the parameters which feel to me as limitations when I look back, they're only limitations because I try to live within them, right? Mm -hmm. So I must keep going. I have to actually allow myself to move outside of the limitations that are behind me, right, in order to feel, you know, going back to this idea of competence, in order to feel my own permission to do so. In other words, you know, Hellinger said, Bert Hellinger said many, many years ago in one of his many aphorisms, uh, you know, he had 
has so many aphorisms, I don't think he knows which is, which are actually his, <laughs> but he, he chooses deliberately what to quote anyway. Um, yeah. But one of, one of the things that he said is that people are under the impression that insight leads to action and truthfully action leads to insight. And others have said this, and I have said it a million times to myself, that when I sit back and think, that only gets me so far. I need to think, sit back and rest, and then stand up again and take a step, and then thought comes to me, new thought comes to me. And which with each actual step that I take outside of the limitations of the past, which are only limitations for me, they're not limitations for, you know, I I look back and I look at my mother and my father and I look at their lineages, right? And for me, those are limitations. For me going deeper into my life, those are limitations. But as I look back, I see, For them, they were parameters, right? Mm. So in other words, forging the new path is exactly how I move out and exactly how I convince myself of my own right to do so. Because with each step that I take out of their limitations, out of those parameters that are not my parameters, My love grows for them. My respect grows for them. My gratitude grows. But I have to take the step for that to happen. Does that make any sense to you? Yes, it makes complete sense. I'm touching into the movement and the whole body moving moving for Mm -hmm. more to come and for the response of inner and outer to arise as well as what the parameters were for your parents or who's behind you become limitations or could have seemed to have been limitation for you if you followed the same parameters. And parameter and limitation, if I'm getting you right, Susie, and parameter and limitation sound so different. What sounds to me like well, it, it relates to something that I experienced too, which is where I'm touching in, is the parameters that my grandmother lived by. If I'm living by the same ones, they become limitation, but I can see and honor how actually that was expansion for her. Absolutely. That's, that's beautifully said. Absolutely. And then it's not for me anymore. It's not expansion for me. It was what I lived in and what came through. Right. But mine is a new expansion. That's right. And that's so that's so perfectly said because, you know, in your new expansion, they're, you know, sort of like at your back, you can feel the warmth of and it's funny, you go back to the beginning of our conversation. At your back, you can feel the warmth of completion. Mm. And in your body, you can feel the competence of movement. And at your front. We feel the lightness of possibility. Mm. Yes. And, th- and that becomes the warmth of completion for your children, for your students, Candace, for your, th- for your clients, for your future. I can be that kind of warmth of completion for the future. And still for me, it's the lightness of what's to come. Both things. Mm, it just feels like magical. <laughs> like, like I'm tingling inside. Thank you for that. Thank you for the words. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I was just I was laughing and thinking like you wouldn't think I was so cynical. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? Just no, I don't know. In my mind's eye, I think of myself as a deeply cynical person. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> but then I hear my own, you know, words come out of my mouth, and I think, well, I believe that was the parameters of my mother and father. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it's, in, it's important to me because, you know, it's sort of where humor comes from. Uh-huh. But it actually 
is not fully mined, at least not in that same way. Yeah. Well, the last time we spoke, we talked about the sentences that aren't spoken in the family lineage. Those are the words that get passed down or that we hold connection with that want to be spoken. And I felt like that was just so helpful. Something about that completed or felt at the time, it completed a piece of understanding trauma to me. Mm -hmm. It's like, how do we receive words about ourselves in the world that we may or may not have connection with in our personal life, except then we've created connection with it or lived in it. But that really gave me a new understanding of words. Yeah, I love that. Also, I'm just recalling back to when I first learned with you about the sentence. And I'm just wondering how that's evolving for you. And what I'm referring to is, I don't think I'll say it as I learned it from you, but the aspect of a sentence and that association to death sentence. Is it a death sentence, a, a sentence we're speaking that sends us to that destructive place? or? What kind of sentence are you saying to yourself or to the world? Right. And it's funny, I would put it the opposite in a way, because I think that in this case, the opposite actually includes what you're saying, right? So it's fun. It's a funny, uh, and maybe it goes back to the light and dark, right? That the yeah. lightness can, can hold the dark, where the darkness tends to snuff out the light. So, mm -hmm. The, the way I see it is as a life sentence, right? Mm -hmm. So a life sentence is either one of two things. It is either the sentence that we live with for our life, <laughs> right? And that tends to be driven by generational experience, and it tends to be a fear-driven sentence, whether it's uh, mean or it's overly... Uh, ingratiating or it's you know too much or too little the reason it lacks nuance is because it's fear driven and nuance requires courage in a way to say I'm responsible and I love you and I have power and I feel vulnerable those are nuances that require a certain very deep level of confidence to experience let alone say so those kind of uh, difficult life sentences are fear-driven messages that come through the generations, right? Mm -hmm. And they come from visceral reactions to things. So, you know, in constellations, one looks for the event often, not so much to redress the event, for God's sakes, who would I be to redress slavery or the Holocaust or, you know, somebody's home burning down when they were two years old. That to me is a ridiculous and um, that's, that's a terrible conceit. However, however, to see that uh, certain messages came through the direct reactions to those events, which are fear driven, people run away, you know, all the fight, flight, freeze things that we talk about in ourselves, of course, we're nested in them too, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the sentence that comes from freeze or the sentence that comes from flight is the, feels like the really big one or, yeah. the sentence that, or the sentence that comes from fight. Those messages that come down through the generations and inform our bodies often not our minds, not we don't know it, but we know it, right? Our gut says, be afraid. Our gut says, take out a knife. Our gut says, reject before rejected, right? Whatever our gut says in those insta instances is not necessarily, and I think often not, a accurate read of what's going on before us, but rather a felt read of what went on behind us. So mm -hmm. the good life sentences or the life sentences that are affirmations of life 
are the sentences that Hellinger in, introduced as stem sentences. And I call them seed sentences because I, I just like the idea of planting seeds. But they're sentences that are actually really in this, the uh, system that are not, you know, they're outside of, in addition to often forgotten sentences that are not fear driven. They go back to the intrinsic faith of moving forward. Mm -hmm. So there is an intrinsic part of every system that moves forward. And trauma gives us the impression that the system started in that place. But in fact, there was a time long before that. And the sense that we can kind of tap into the deepest parts of the system, the heartbeat, where the heart is still beating, um, gives us uh, the the sentence that is not fear driven, the message that is not fear driven. Mm -hmm. And that message is always about go into the future, live deep into your life. That's a gift for us that reorganizes the past. I'm just laughing at myself because I guess I must have had so many death sentences <laughs> to look at. Because now as you're saying that, I remember this being about life sentence. <laughs> that is funny. Well, when you, you, right? think, about, you think about uh, prisons, right? And you think it, it, it's saying a funny thing or an interesting thing. You give somebody a death sentence, you take away all possibility, even the slightest, right? Yeah. And you give somebody a life sentence, and not to say that's not going to be a very challenging life, but the one thing you don't do is snuff out all possibility. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, I'm really interested. I think it is interesting for you, and you'll think about it. I think the language that we speak to ourselves with is incredibly profound. And this phrase, self-talk, it's, it's like, uh, uh, yeah, it is self-talk, but it's also something deeper or more primal than self-talk. It is the way we hold ourselves, the way we understand ourselves. And I think we often do quite a job in entrancing ourselves in a past that we don't even know in our mind, but we know so well in our body. Mm -hmm. The idea of moving from death sentence to life sentence, and then from life sentence to life sentence, right? Life yeah. affirming sentence. That's really moving out of a trance. Absolutely. And it, it gives back the dimensions of quote unquote self-talk brings back that depth of where it came from and what it might refer to and what clues we have from that of who we believe we are, how we're holding ourselves. Yeah, beautiful. And it's a movement, you know, I talk to people sometimes about this idea of moving from dynamic, which has to do again with, you know, the parameters being limitations for us and simply being parameters for the people who came before us. So that is moving out of a dynamic into moving into relationship, right? And dynamic and relationship are two different things. A dynamic is a structure that we keep returning to and relationship is evolving by definition. So what you just said, I kind of hadn't thought of it that before in terms of the self that we are often in a dynamic with ourselves, a habit mm. and moving into that more fluid more surprising relationship with ourselves mm. is first and foremost how we're going to experience ourselves in the world differently and the world in us differently mm. yeah that, that changes completely the feel of it 
and what we're doing here. <laughs> and I mean, what we're doing here in terms of being human. <laughs> yeah, no, I do. I heard you. <laughs> yeah, I think you got me. Yeah. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> yeah, right. Like what, what we're even here. To, to right. Or, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I know. It's like people, you know, we, when we talk about the search for meaning, it's like, ah, I don't think it's a search exactly. You know, I think the meaning is is implicit. It is the sort of allowance for meaning mm. and bother to take it seriously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I feel that one. <laughs> the bother to take it seriously. <laughs> me, too, me too. That's why I can say yeah. it with such a such enthusiasm because I know what it takes in me to remind myself I get into such a habit of um, a lethargic soul you know yeah well what um what about it I, I was curious to ask you you know what challenges you find for yourself now as a person or a facilitator teacher in any any place well, it's a little bit like anything else that has to do, I think, with taking care of our internal and external selves. You know, it is it's funny. It's like there are moments where I forget to care, and that's both inward and outward. And that's a little bit like, it almost feels like a really young rebellion. And it feels like a very uh, childish power. Well, I cannot care. <laughs> yeah, because it sounds like the adult words are, I forget to care. But the younger part says something else, like, I don't want to care. <laughs> or, I can stomp my feet and, you know, put my hands across my chest and pretend that's something. But I think that that is a... Again, sort of a habit of not, you know, sometimes I say to people and I say it to myself most of all, I know very well that the world will go on without me and it will do just fine, but it doesn't have to. Mm, beautiful. I can make a contribution and that will give something. And in that, extending of my hand, I receive something before anything or anyone even gives back. Oh, yeah, that's beautiful. That seems to go right back to where we started as well, the mm -hmm. pebbles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Funny, Candace, once I was sitting around and a bunch of people were talking about enlightenment and I get very quiet during these conversations because yeah. I don't know what the hell enlightenment is, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, of course, you know, sometimes silence is very loud. <laughs> 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 so one of the people at the table who was the one person I didn't know turned to me and said, you know, well, so what do you think it is, Susie? <laughs> ah. <laughs> And the word that came out of my mouth was creativity. Oh. That is my belief system. It's my entire belief system, really. Wow. And you were earlier saying to me, creativity, learning is creativity. Right. One and the same. And that makes even more to the picture for me when you say that. That's cool. And I, you know, that's funny because when you, you asked before, and I think I glossed over it about the idea of, you know, what it takes to teach and I think I've been through some shit you know <laughs> yeah and I don't wear it as a badge but to say there is something I know in other people's experience because I've been through some stuff and I won't say I've come out the other side I don't know that I've come out anywhere but I will say that I continue to want to create. I continue to feel the revelation in that. And it keeps me happy. It keeps me joyful. It keeps me flexible. And I think when people come 
into a room where I'm teaching, they may dislike the way I teach or not understand what the hell I'm talking about or think what I'm saying is trite or not deep enough or too deep or whatever it is they mm-hmm. think. But I think there is the feeling that somehow she has been through some stuff and she has retained joy. Mm. I want I want some of that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you. It makes a difference to me as well. And it's something, what you're saying now is something that I really look to you to remember. It's not always easy for me. I can get lost in some mind stuff, like talking about things that I may not know or, and when I say no, I'm like, no, in my body. And what I experience you doing, which feels so embodied, is that you speak to what you experience and you might go into realms beyond your experience and explore. This is just my perception. I don't experience that you speak to things that you don't know in your bones somehow, or that if you do, you're acknowledging that in some way. To me, that feels really grounded. Do you do you perceive yourself that way? Is is that landing somewhere for you? Yes. When you say it, I, you, I recognize it. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, sometimes people use the word humility. You know, there are words that people use like humility or intuition or certain words that people use that I, I'm not sure what's meant by them in a, in a certain way. But I think that actually what folks are referring to is exactly that, that there is a kind of compass that each of us has, right? Mm -hmm. And I really try to respect my compass, even when I'm not sure, like I don't get ahead of it, I think. Mm. yeah, I look to it and I really try not to get ahead of it. And my body, you know, you talk, you talk so much about being embodied. My body tells me so much. You know, I can feel when I am in a place that I have no business being because I get immediately nauseous. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and I don't power through that. I don't muscle through it. I stop and I look and I say, why is that? But I say that as I'm withdrawing from that space and I go back to my compass, because if I don't do that and I power through that physical response mechanism in my body, then I'm left with such a narrow vocabulary where I have to blame the client for something, right? Mm. Or I have to become insecure and shy and somehow withdraw, right? Mm -hmm. But if I can go back to my compass and check in and say, okay, you know, you were in a space you had no business being in. How can you both return and not return in the same way? And it's often through making contact with the person who actually is in that space, asking a question. Mm -hmm. Seeing, you know, that idea of I see you. Well, boy, sometimes I think facilitators, me as a facilitator, we really got to have that sentence, I see you, not yeah. just offer it. <laughs> we got to live it. Yeah. And that, that it is extremely powerful in itself. Mm-hmm. And it's enough sometimes. Well, maybe it's enough always. It's a big, big little sentence, right? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah. Well, Susie, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation with you and learned so much. Is there anything else that feels alive now or that you want to share? Uh, Well, first of all, I learned so much as well. And uh, as a living example of collaboration, you know, I heard myself say things I've never heard myself say. 
and I love that. I love that. It's like new colors on the palette. Yeah. Uh, and I really invite people to explore in themselves this sense of competence and the ability to integrate so that their feet irresistibly want to move down that road toward more. Thank you. I'll receive that for myself as well. Yeah. I'll take that too. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Me, too. me too, Candace. Me too. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And whoever listens, thank you so much for listening. And uh, yeah, let's toss a pebble, okay? Yes. Thank you so much, Susie. You're and- welcome. Thank you. It's been fabulous. And um, for all of the people listening, uh, Susie is going to be offering a guided experience. It'll be a surprise, right? We'll see. To me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's only truly alive that way. Yes. Yes. So thank you so much. And you can look out for that if you're listening in. And um, until next time, Susie. Looking forward. Thank you all for tuning into our conversation today. And thank you, Susie, so much for being on the show. It's a huge honor. And I feel just so invigorated and excited about moving into my life differently, even by just the words that we brought to light today. If you found her resonance or words exciting to you, interesting or intriguing, I'd encourage you to check out her work at susietucker.com. S U Z I. T U C K E R, Susie with a Z. She also is the writer of her book, Gather Enough Fireflies, which is available on Amazon. I appreciate her book very much because it's small in size, but jam packed with seeds of insight from her very personal experience. Susie's also co editor and contributing author to Messengers of Healing and the contributing author to. For Couples, Ten Commandments for Every Aspect of Your Relationship Journey. Also stay tuned this week because she will be offering a lovely guided experience around competency. If you don't want to miss this, make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you get the downloads straight to your device and consider subscribing to my newsletter, which will give you all the information as well as other healing experiences and self-love tips. You can find all that at CandiceWu.com slash embody. Thank you all again. And as we go, I want to send you off with some of Susie's thoughts, which I don't know if I'll get exactly right, but it goes something like this. While the world would carry on without you, it is enriched by your presence. Thank you all so much for being out there and listening in and for your existence. And with that, see you next time on the Embody Podcast.